Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Bob to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan, for that too generous, even extraordinary introduction. And if your intention was to make me speechless, you've almost succeeded. <laughs> I have to say, um, I expect that you thought as I came up here about the challenge of making these remarks at the end of this remarkable evening. But I have to tell you, I had actually a, a greater challenge earlier this evening. My lovely wife purchased a wonderful lemon and black bow tie which I completely failed in trying to tie here tonight. <laughs> which means I had to call the folks in Farmville and withdraw my application for Hampton Sydney's presidency. Mr. Cabell's here tonight. He's going to pass that word along. <laughs> Alan, just know that Cheryl and I count it as the highest privilege of our lives to have landed here at Randolph-Macon College. Thank you. And thank you, Alan, especially for the leadership you are giving to our board of trustees in these important times. It, too, is extraordinary. Indeed, this college is blessed to have had and to continue to have outstanding board of trustees leadership through the years. Alan mentioned two former board chairs. I've had the great fortune to have known personally four wonderful board chairs here, starting with the late John Clements, whose leadership of the board from 1983 to 1994 is renowned. We certainly miss John, but we are happy that the Clements family is well represented today on the board of trustees by his highly effective son, Peter, Please stand and let us recognize you, Peter. And Mr. Clements was followed by a truly superb board chair, Beverly English Dalton, whose continued dedication to Randolph-Macon is simply unparalleled. And now whose breadth of board service across higher education in the Commonwealth is legendary and perhaps unsurpassed. But it all started right here during your highly successful years as our board chair, 1994 to 2000. Beverly, won't you please rise and accept our thanks for your leadership. And you've already heard from Macon Brock, the chair with whom I very gratefully began my service here. Macon, it is a privilege to continue serving here with you and Joan still by our sides. You are both champions indeed. Please stand and let us say thank you again.
And for the past six and a half years, I've had the great privilege and pleasure of working side by side with Chairman Alan Rashkin, and it is a privilege. Alan, you represent so well that splendid lineage of excellence in leadership here in every way. Thank you. That great board leadership and our outstanding board of trustees, whose faith in this institution was manifested early on by their support of this campaign, coupled with the extraordinary generosity of you alumni and friends here with us tonight and others just like you who have been so very supportive all of you are the absolute fuel of our success at Randolph-Macon College. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And those of you supporting us so generously, just who are you caring for here? First, we are especially blessed at Randolph-Macon with outstanding faculty. Tonight we heard from Professor Beth Gill and Provost Bill Franz, both so very representative of a fabulous group of teacher scholars who come to this campus each and every day, laser focused, first and foremost, on the question of how best to help their particular students be successful. And Diane Lauder and Barclay Dupriest well represented the excellence of our highly effective and caring and productive staff. Great folks who work on the grounds and buildings, fix our computers, recruit our students, keep them safe and motivated and fed and learning outside the classroom and coaches that make the Yellow Jackets the fiercest competitors in the ODAC. Yes, indeed, we are truly blessed with a talented staff at Randolph-Macon College. But most importantly, your gifts, your support, your treasure enable the main event here at Randolph-Macon, the success of our talented and enthusiastic students. Maggie and Derek and Cameron and Talbot and PJ and our 20 fabulous centerpiece makers. Who says a liberal arts college can't teach a trade? <laughs> our pep band, our choir, our cheerleaders, all of the students here with us tonight are just terrific examples of the 400 plus, excuse me, 1400 plus, doesn't that sound better? And growing students at Randolph-Macon, of whom I can passionately and emphatically say those of us who come to work here each day feel absolutely privileged to be around. And I always say, spend enough, spend enough time on this campus and you will feel better about this country's and our world's future. I can guarantee that. <laughs> Board members, alumni, faculty, staff, and students. The people of Randolph-Macon are truly extraordinary. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now certainly as we've heard here tonight, the numbers in this campaign are impressive. $125 million, over $80 million before all is said and done spent on renovations and new facilities. $47 million in new endowments. 
$22 million in faculty and academic program support, five new endowed professorships, and two more added to, over $15 million in scholarship endowment with 92 new scholarships created, 12,139 donors making a gift to the campaign, including, and I'm so very proud of this, 573 current and retired faculty and staff members contributing to the campaign as well. Sixty-six percent of our alumni made a gift to the campaign during the time of this effort, leading to an alumni giving percentage that Alan mentioned of 40 percent, placing us first in the Commonwealth, 16th among 4,000 colleges and universities in the country. Your incredible support is literally changing the face of Randolph-Macon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A year after our special college was founded, way back in 1830 in Boynton, Virginia, Frenchman Alexis de Tocqueville made a trip from his homeland to the United States, at first to study our prisons and then he sought to find out why this very young country was already becoming an economic powerhouse in the world, and to explain that back to his countrymen in France. He wound up spending just nine months here, and he wrote two remarkable volumes entitled Democracy in America. Chronicling his travels, and summarizing his views as to why this burgeoning nation had a sense of greatness about it. He described the concept of volunteer spirit in our building of a robust civil society here, leading to the formation of what he called real communities, communities of the soul, communities of volunteerism, now, there's no evidence that Tocqueville ever made it to Boydton. <laughs> and in those early years of RMC, I'm not sure what he would have seen there. But if one of his descendants had parachuted in here tonight to be with us at this dinner, I am confident that they would see that same spirit of community, of brother and sisterhood, and of sacrifice for the larger good that so mesmerized and impressed our 19th century French visitor. Our visitor tonight might comment about how college alumni generously support their alma maters long after they have graduated, unselfishly, with extraordinary sums for extraordinary projects all given through campaigns that are themselves called extraordinary, and all to provide a fabulous educational experience for this generation, for future generations, with a genuine sense of optimism and hope and cheer. So the, for the very embodiment of Tocqueville's vision of a remarkable community with a glorious future, I say thank you, thank you, thank you. And speaking of the future, I have two other books I want to mention ever so briefly. Here they are, the two-volume set of James Scanlon's marvelous history of Randolph-Macon College. These are available in our bookstore, by the way. <laughs> Did I get that right, Barclay? 
And on this special night, it is a privilege to ask you to join me in saluting a wonderful faculty member emeritus, mentor of literally hundreds, if not thousands of students, and a college historian extraordinaire, Dr. James Scanlon. Now these books are interesting in many ways. What has always fascinated me is how James covered the five years before our founding in 1830 all the way up through 1967, so 142 years, all in 480 pages, a reasonably stout volume. But then his second book, covering 1967 to 2005, or just 38 years, the very years, by the way, that correspond with James being an active faculty member here on the campus, <laughs> 771 pages. So there's absolutely no telling how many pages the next 38 years will take. But I can guarantee you two things about volume three of the Randolph-Macon story, whether James writes it or not, whoever writes it, whenever it is written, whether it covers 30 or 40 or 50 years, here are two guarantees about that third volume. Number one, I can safely say that chapter one is going to be about tonight, about this campaign, about this era, about you, our generous alumni, and friends and faculty and staff who have done so very much, pouring your hearts and soul and treasure into this place and producing such a mon monumental change, helping so much to put us on track for a brighter future. That first chapter will be about tonight and won't that be fun to read? But my second guarantee about volume three is even more important, and here it is. Whatever chapters come after that first chapter, the one about tonight in this era, whatever chapters follow that one, those are going to be the most important chapters not just in volume three, but the most important chapters in all three books in our history. Where you see whatever we have accomplished up to this point here tonight, and it is gigantic. Witness this wonderful and totally appropriate celebration at hand. But whatever we have accomplished up until tonight is not as important, not as significant, not as consequential as what we do next, as what the next chapters are to come. And what will those additional chapters show? One view might be that tonight was the pinnacle, that we started out by saying, now is the time. And it turned out it was indeed the time, the pinnacle, the mountaintop for Randolph-Macon College. But I hope not. I hope that book will say that this robust community of Randolph-Macon 2016 after smashing through that magnificent
campaign goal after surpassing those heretofore unfathomable numbers, this community of Randolph-Macon 2016 continued to rise. Continued to rise with a commitment to make Randolph-Macon College even better for future generations. Continued to rise with more scholarships enabling us to attract even more excellent students like the ones here tonight. Continued to rise with more professorships, enabling, enabling us to attract even more excellent faculty like the ones here tonight. Continued to rise with even better facilities to better match up with our talented faculty and staff who continue to pour their heart and soul into this wonderful place, but to do so knowing they are secure in their future and in their livelihoods. Continue to rise by always providing a powerfully complete liberal arts education accompanied by our equally powerful and intentional focus on what happens to our students after they graduate. Continue to rise through even greater loyalty and generosity from our alumni and friends. So our challenge is to use this pinnacle we celebrate tonight, this platform from which we can see for miles, to use it to make those following chapters about the true renaissance of Randolph-Macon College, the true golden era of our beloved RMC. That's what we want those chapters to say. And I know we can do it. I know we can continue to rise starting tonight because of this remarkable community, because of you, and because you, all of you, are simply the best. Thank you, thank you, thank you.